Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Caroline Lewis. And me, Matt Skinner. And me, Joy J. Moore. The text for the second Sunday after Epiphany, which falls on January 14, 2024, are 1 Samuel 3, 1 through 10, and additional reading verses of 11 through 20, Psalm 139, 1 through 6, and 13 through 18. 1 Corinthians is our second reading, chapter 6, 12 through 20. And our gospel reading is John 1, 43 through 51. So here we're getting into the heart of Epiphany. And we have two Sundays in a row of the calling of the disciples in John and then in Mark next week. So that is one place to begin just to see, note the differences and how you might preach the specifics of each of those calls, not to do necessarily call, uh, you know, gospel comparison, because that's always a riveting kind of uh, sermon. But it is to say, it invite people into what their own maybe call story or their own sense of of remembrance or memory or experience around when they felt ready when they felt called to follow Jesus when they experienced that invitation uh, that that uh, moment and that it it's not the same for everybody and and the responses are going to be different and and so how might you it, how might you help people think about their own experience of of taking on uh, taking on that call from Jesus uh, would be one one direction but uh but here we have John 1 43 to fi- so that's one idea i have uh <laughs> what do you think i'm i'm guessing you have others oh, <laughs> I do. Yeah. yeah yeah but uh, but just to note that you know and as you look at both of these stories side by side, I think that matters. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think that's helpful. I, I think as long we have to, um, I think we also have to help clarify for people into what are you being called? Mm-hmm. So they don't think it's, you know, call sometimes people think I have to become a priest now or a yeah, nun yeah. or something like that, but it's no. call to do what? And I would say, you know, this is not a a totally neat and clean division here, but in Mark next week, the call is to follow. In John, there's also mention of follow, but there's also this language of see. Right. You will see. Mm. And also find language also. So, I mean, what does it mean to be called to see something? Or what does it mean to be called next week to follow someone and follow where? To me, that's easier to get my head around. So I don't think it's about a profession or a career or a you know, or, or a job, um, or task, but it's, no, it's, a, it's a, it's a call into what it means to be a disciple of Jesus and what that looks like. And, uh, and as you mentioned, Matt, that we have the specific language around the call of the disciples in John rests around come and see you will see you know you will see greater things than these which then is going to work in uh it's going to demand some interpretation of what it is that you see and what difference does that make i also follow and then of course this finding and so i that he that he found you know that he found philip and and this becomes one of the dominant uh, words, right, in the call narrative in John of of this mutual finding, mm-hmm. and uh, and that this will be also a charge for the disciples uh, going forward of finding new <laughs> new disciples, so that they're part of what they're called to. You to go back to your question. Uh, your observation, Matt, is they're called to this mutual finding. They're called to this, and Jesus will take them to 
Samaria to find the woman at the well, even mm-hmm. though that verb isn't there. I think there's an allusion to why Jesus, one of the reasons why Jesus goes to uh, to Samaria to find another disciple who then also says, come and see. But mm-hmm. also John, it foreshadows John 10, 16. I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them in also. And then John 20, as the Father has sent me, so also I send you. So it really taps into uh, and that apostolic uh, sense of John, which is rooted in John 3.16. So when you think about what is it that discipleship looks like, uh, what are some features, characteristics of this, this being called into relationship with Jesus, those are some of those, uh, some of those extensions of that acceptance. I highlighted uh, the finding as well. Um, I thought that that's a a good place to land. Um, So I appreciated uh, your uh, illuminating uh, all those different uh, threads uh, that come from that, Caroline. Um, Another another way which is parallel to what you just uh, identified is the decision of Jesus to go to Galilee. Um, uh, we will see throughout uh, these journeys, if I can use that word, our, our, our intentional acts that are decisions of Jesus from uh, who is called, from where they go, from what they can do or what they are uh, prohibited from doing, um, for who they will interact with, um, on what occasions. Um, um, th- those are those are uh, active decisions that are made, and uh, I think if we read the text clearly, what we will find is that those decisions are are um, not absolute. Just as we look at these call narratives, they are not singular. So that a decision not to interact or a decision not to go is not a prohibition against ever going or ever acting. And and I think that becomes uh, noteworthy as we closely read those texts. That would be another direction. Yeah, it's a really important point, Joy, that there's Jesus is operating under a different kind of itinerary than anybody else seems to realize. And we'll Right. He'll delay going to see Lazarus, for example. There's other things he's going to do that make you wonder. Like, I think he knows more than everybody else in this story in terms of what's going on. And I have a quick question about this passage for both of you. Um, it. So it's Epiphany, which is about you know the manifestation of God. So it's you know we're learning something about who Jesus is in these stories about his early ministry. Nathaniel discerns you are the son of God, you are the king of Israel. At the end of the gospel, Thomas is going to say, my Lord and my God, John 11, 12, it's going to be, you know, reference to Jesus as the Messiah. Um, what's significant about what Nathaniel says here? Is this the answer or is this just the beginning? Like, What has been revealed to Nathaniel in this confession that he makes here? Does that make sense? And does it, or does it not matter? Like it's significant to me, not just that Jesus is calling people, but also Nathaniel's glimpsing something utterly remarkable (laughs) as the outcome of a very short exchange he's had with Jesus. That's a great uh, question, uh, Matt. Uh, And there, it's not a it's not a guess what I'm thinking question. I honestly don't. Well, I think I my my hunch is that it lands on. Nathaniel, uh, the question, where did you get to know me? And I saw you under the fig tree before Philip called you. I feel like there's, you know, there's a ton of backstory here, but that use of the word no, and I saw you, and then the response of Nathaniel of then having a glimpse of knowing Jesus has I think that's tied into the larger framework uh, theme of John of relationship, and so the the, the primary call uh, and what it means to believe. Do you believe because I told you I saw you under the fig tree? Believing again is not is not necessarily this 
um, knowledge of God or a knowledge of Jesus as it is a, as it is a, an entering into a relationship that is going to lead to uh, abundant life. And so I feel like that that's kind of uh, behind this. This exchange is is a recognizing that Nathaniel or that Jesus knows Nathaniel and where does that come from and and uh, and that his that his response is maybe a little bit uh, premature. <laughs> uh, I think, uh, but there is a, there is maybe a kind of willingness to. Uh, to know Jesus just as he's been known, which we get to with the woman at the well, you know, that she's her recognition of the fact that Jesus knows all about her and, uh, and he just met her. (laughs) And so I, that's, that's my, that's my sense of it, but that, but there is a caveat, right? That Jesus offers, you will see greater things than these. And those, those greater things are the, you know, the greater works of Jesus, which are, you know, bringing people into that relationship with him and with, with, uh, with God and, and the heavens open and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the son and man, essentially that Jesus himself is the place where, the earthly and heavenly meet. And yet we can't, you know, we can't, the fullness of the incarnation, we can't really see at this point. We're just, uh, so I, I, yeah, that's a long answer, but how I think about it. Yeah. Yeah. No, I appreciate that. And, and, and I appreciate the question, Matt. Um, I think that thread is uh, also there in, um, as you were describing what, what was premature, uh, Caroline, um, uh, in, in the response, do you believe because I told you that I saw you? Um, there's a similarity in, uh, mm, it, it's slightly different phrasing, uh, but each of those other places where, where Jesus is acknowledged. Um, uh, in John 11, um, uh, do you believe in in um, the Messiah? Uh, in John four, uh, you know she's going to say, "Yeah, I, I know that the the Messiah is coming." Um, in in um, uh, there was another one that I had in mind, and it's gone right now. But that um, the, the Thomas the Thomas text is the one I'm thinking in uh, uh, again. Uh, that that sense of of uh, w- what we look at as uh, a doubt, uh, that that similar kind of doubt would be uh, a sense of trying to understand who Jesus is and what um, what what he's come to recognize, and yet really not knowing at all. Uh, and so, in in this, it seems clear. Oh gosh, yes, yes, you are the one. You are the one. But what is clear? as you were saying, uh, Caroline. And then um, when we get later on where we have now all of these uh, expressions of Jesus, activities of Jesus, accounts of Jesus, testimonies to Jesus, where people are slower to say, yes, you are. Um, it, it's almost as if the more the more evidence that is the, there, the less people are uh, able to accept and in 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 some ways that changes the meaning of the words you will see greater things than these because as i read it here i would think oh gosh you show me something bigger and i'm going to be falling on my faith saying yes you are my lord and my god and that's not what happens <laughs> yeah yeah well and the thing is is that nathaniel's response is really a penal claim of who yes. jesus Yes, it's not um, even to claim Jesus as Messiah is a is not the fullness of who Jesus exactly. is in John. Exactly. It is not the full identity of who Jesus is. It's a it's a penultimate. It's a penultimate acknowledgement of yes. who Jesus could be. Yes, because the, the true is that is this is the Word made flesh and flesh. the incarnated God. And so, uh, so even even though Nathaniel's response looks like he's got some things together that's it's we're not we're not there yet i think we're we should probably move on but one other homiletical direction i would take 
I, I've preached on this before is uh, the question, can anything good come out of Nazareth? <laughs> and I, uh, and how, how, how we ask that question as well. I'm sure that the, the disciples asked that question of Jesus, at least I think they probably did when they went to Samaria, can anything good come out of Samaria? Uh, can anything good come out of you, you name it. And yeah. um, the way in which you can build a sermon around that, that question of expectations and location and assumptions about just who, uh, just who Jesus is, but also whom Jesus will call. Uh, yes. The, the commentary uh, notes the misconceptions and expectations to which we are all suspect. I think you're right. We need to move on, but (laughs) yeah, Yeah, we talked a lot about that. Yes, a lot, a lot to say there. Yes, yes. Yeah, I, I have to appreciate Jason Biasi's um, uh, note. In uh, today is not the only day that our faith communities have seemed blind, deaf, hapless, and without resources. The more I read the Old Testament uh, text in our current uh, climate socially and ecclesially. um, I just, I am almost frightened by uh, uh, how the ancient words become a commentary on the present um, communities of faith and society at large. It's a real good commentary about the contrast here between Eli and Samuel. Yes. To do that. I have yeah. two thoughts on this passage. One is, you know, it's a nice pairing for Jesus knowing Nathaniel and, you know, here's the idea of a God who knows Samuel and a great way to talk about calling, you know, the the callings of people like Moses and Ezekiel and Isaiah would have scared the living daylights out of me. This, there's something more tender about the calling of Samuel, but also scary to hear voices when you're lying in bed calling your name. And, but I, I think I want... Here's the thing. This is also in the United States for our listeners there. This is also Martin Luther King Jr.'s birthday weekend. And so a holiday on Monday. I want to figure this is the text that seems to lend itself well to a a sermon that wants to honor his theological legacy. You know, it's popular to call, to refer to King as a prophet. uh, And I get that and all for that. But notice then what what Eli's first, I'm sorry, what um, Samuel's first prophecy is about Eli, right? So Eli, the one who helps mediate this call, the first prophecy is, by the way, your household is you know utterly corrupt and its days are numbered. And it's just a helpful reminder the way in which our, our memories, I should say, a lot of white churches' memories of Dr. King are so sanitized, you know, as if we ought to have been there right next to him, you know, when this was happening. Uh, but to talk about how he was vilified and to talk about the way in which a prophet is called to deliver hard news, not because they necessarily want to, but because God has commissioned them to tell the truth. And and we can respond like Eli, who seems to be rather gracious, like, you know, the judgments of the Lord are just. Uh, it seems to be the, the bulk, the gist of what he's saying, um, that Eli can still honor God through his acknowledgement of the truth about who he is and who his sons are. You know what I mean? That in other words, repentance, confession are not just admissions of failure. They are also ways in which you honor God and the truth of the gospel moving forward. This is coming, of course, from a you know white male perspective on, on King, but that's where I would take a sermon on this if I was preaching this weekend. Yeah. I mean, does that make any sense in terms of where I'm going about how Absolutely. complicated the role okay. of a prophet is and what do you do when the prophet <laughs> singles you out um, for and judgment? I, I, yeah, I, I think that's really helpful. And I would point our listeners to uh, a paragraph in the commentary that really brings that out. And, you know, and, and it relates to the question that that Jason asked, and you thought our churches were having a hard day. <laughs> uh, I think we're, you know, we're still there. And, and, uh, but that last paragraph of, of, you know, that God will raise up faithfulness in the debris of human unfaithfulness 
and in a religious world where we often cling to the husks of things long dead, this is a good, this is a good news. Um, there is a new generation coming. God will not let its words fall to the ground. The best days of God's people are not behind us. Uh, no, the best are still to come with yet more prophets and an entire world redeemed. God's people cannot be known for our nostalgia. We must be known for our hope. And that mm -hmm. really does capture King's spirit, uh, known for our hope. And, and that, uh, and that when we wonder if um, the word of the Lord <laughs> is, is if we can't hear the word of the Lord, how can we cling to that hope that is our promise? Uh, and, and affirm that as as a church, as the, that's one of the calls of the church, right? And the 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 calling of the church um, as a body of disciples is to embody that hope. I really appreciate that. There's a um, there's a difficulty even today of uh, of recognizing that um, we want, as you said, Matt, we we want to claim um, that. We were all on board with King. Um, there were a lot in the Black church that were not on board with King either. Um, and today, um, we have a difficulty with that as well. Um, we we still live in a world of, of corruption, uh, of oppression, and um, despite uh, some of the gains that have been made, it's very hard to accept uh, a nonviolent, hopeful um, possibility. And um, what, what seems to be more uh, in the Black community as well as what we see uh, beyond um, uh, what's happening in Congress or what's happening in uh, DC or what's happening around the world, you name the zip code, um, is violence. Um, oppression, my people over your people, um, my tribe winning. Um, we look like everybody else. And the problem that is true for Eli, Eli's household, is they were looking like everybody else. And fast forward, that's exactly what the people are going to ask of Samuel in his retirement. They're going to call him back and say, we want to look like everybody else. And, and I mention that not just because I like to thread the stories together, but because we are low these many years beyond King's death. And sometimes I wonder if the society that wants to highlight King doesn't want to say, but we want to ask one last thing of you. We want to look like the enemies that your words uh, criticized, that your words properly condemned. That's a hard word to preach to. Uh, for the psalm, I would uh, use that somehow in that in with connection to Jesus knowing Nathaniel, right? You have... Uh, you have searched me and know me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up, uh, and and that would be a, I, I think bringing in those words for a, a sermon that looked at that exchange as we were talking about earlier between Jesus and Nathaniel, and that knowing, being known by by the Lord, being known by Jesus. Um, how can you put people in that place too, so that? the calling of the disciples uh, or being, you know, being called or being brought into this relationship is, uh, is a really intimate thing. That's a, it's a, um, it's, and it's a, an invitation, come and see into being known what that feels like to be truly known. And I, so that's something that I would do with the Psalm. Um, I think there's an incredible expanse of God's knowledge of us. And that this is this this psalm uh, acknowledges that in in its fullness. Um, it is the same knowing um, that is described in Samuel. Um, so I think this text, uh, this psalm, goes with all of the texts for today. And and I would just um, ask 
preachers not to be distracted um, by the preconceptions of this text that can be read at verse 16 and to inquire more deeply um, into exactly what does it mean for uh, God to know us in our um, in our shortcomings and failures, uh, as well as our potential and promise. And uh, like you said, Caroline, the intimacy of that knowledge um, and, and to draw attention to God being in relationship with us um, so that, so that we resist um, missing the fullness of the, all the text uh, that speak to, um, as we've already noted, uh, what does it mean to decide who our enemies are and not pause to get to know them? Um, uh, that would be uh, the um, the uh, John text. Um, or to uh, ha- have this word come from God and be afraid uh, to tell it. Um, or maybe worse, uh, to be unwilling to receive it. And Matt, you've already acknowledged that Samuel, uh, uh, excuse me, that Eli is able to receive it, even though it is it is a uh, it is a judgment against his household. And I think the challenge is to preach a word that reminds our listeners. Uh, to be willing to receive the intimacy of being known by God, whether that is promise or that is critique. And now for something entirely different. Yeah. <laughs> four, First Corinthians. Four Sundays on First Corinthians six, seven, eight, nine. Yeah, which is a hard, hard place to drop in. Yeah. Yeah. In yeah. this letter. Yeah. So I guess what preachers need to know is like Paul and Sosthenes have been working through some issues with the Corinthians here, a lot of concerns. Um, and just recently they've talked about conflicts and lawsuits in the community. And this is a, a community that's tearing itself apart apparently by factionalism and just a kind of spiritual smugness and, and contempt for one another. And Paul appears to be addressing some of their slogans, at least when they say, all things are lawful for me. In other words, they recognize they're free in Christ. And Paul's saying that doesn't mean you don't have accountability to one another. Yeah. And in, yeah, in verse seven or chapter seven, verse one is, you know, Paul says, now concerning the matters about which you wrote. (laughs) So the first six chapters are like, here are the things that I've heard. And we're going to address those, and then then we're going to get to what you are worried about and concerned about. But you get some, of course, some Corinthian themes here uh, that that could connect, I think, a little bit with some of the themes that we've been talking about already about how do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ, and so that that entrance into discipleship or being known uh, by by God um, and by Jesus is an entrance into a community. Uh, mm-hmm. So in so much of oftentimes the, those call stories, right, or those call narratives or when we, uh, you know, decided to follow Jesus uh, and such that uh, that they they are highly individualized. And, but again, going back to your question, Matt, of what are we called to? Then we're called to be in community. We're called to be members. Our bodies are actually in a community. Uh, and there's something really, uh, there's profoundly at stake with that, that it's not just your, it's not just your actions or your words or your, but your very body is going to be present in a part of this, uh, a a part of this community and everything that bodies feel and know and experience. And, and so to follow Jesus, to come and see is a commitment of your, it's not just a mind commitment (laughs) or a heart commitment. It is mind, body, soul, heart, uh, the, that you are then living out uh, in your daily life. And that embodiment 
um, particularly as we read the Corinthians, that embodiment is in the full diversity of the packages in which God has created us to inhabit. And, and so as, 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 as Paul is speaking across all of those differences, um, the same thing is true for us today, um, that that community that we are called to inhabit is a community that crosses all of the preconceptions, which we've talked about a lot this week, all those preconceptions that society has uh, invited us um, uh, to deny entry into a community. And the power of the Holy Spirit is to um, enable us to be joined together into a community that um, um, that crosses the caste and class systems of our society. <laughs>